Hey everybody, this is Darren Van Dam, and you are watching Flick Connection, the show that helps you get more out of movies, and today I'm going to tell you about the absolute best 20 movies currently included with your Prime Video Membership. So this is just a list of the 20 best movies currently available with Prime Video. There are gonna be quite a few movies on this list you have probably seen, so I'm gonna be including a little bit of backstory, a little bit of explanation as to why these movies deserve the spot on the list, possibly making them worth a second watch sometime new in the future, but hopefully there's a handful on this list that you have not seen and need to watch soon before they leave Prime Video. But the strength of this list can be highlighted by how good my number 20 recommendation is. It is my personal favorite Mission Impossible movie out of the entire series, and that would be Mission Impossible 4, Ghost Protocol. Believe it or not, this movie is 10 years old already, and it was directed by Brad Bird. It's the only Mission Impossible movie that he did. He's a little more known for his Pixar movies, like The Incredibles and Ratatouille, and in my opinion, he is brilliant at fun action, key word there being fun. I think Mission Impossible 4 is the most fun movie out of the series because there has been such a variety of directors working on these movies over the years. They're all a little bit different even though they basically follow the same formula and I think this one is easily the most fun one out there. Not just because it's got what I think is probably the best stunt out of the entire series in which Tom Cruise literally is swinging outside of the tallest building of the world in Dubai. This is one of the more colorful ones that they ever made and just has some of the best energy out of the entire series. Even though the last couple have got maybe more critical success because they've been sort of overanalyzed and they are fairly smart, I think it's tough to beat just the exciting, fun nature of Ghost Protocol. She's got so much heart. You think of all the pain and the... Tequila is my lady! My lady! Come on in, guys! One of the best and most loved horror movies to have come out in the past 10 years isn't successful because of how much it borrows from other movies. It borrows from other movies a lot, but it's successful because of how it utilizes all these things that we've seen a dozen times before in Cabin in the Woods. Now, the thing I love about this one is that nothing is what it seems, which can often be the case with crappy movies as well, but Cabin in the Woods is the horror movie for horror movie fans because it takes a lot of elements that you have seen at least a dozen times before and does something very, very different with them while still presenting them to you in a familiar way. The actual Cabin in the Woods looks exactly like the one from the Evil Dead series. The guys in the control room make this movie work in ways that is just absolutely perfect. And the only real big drawback with this one is that it's set up in such a way that they literally could not do a sequel. I mean, they could have, but it probably would have sucked. But then again, that's also its strong suit. It's just kind of how hard the paint this movie ends up going in the third act. Trust me, this is an absolute gem if you love and appreciate all the little elements that they put in there, meaning you watch and love a lot of horror movies, it's hard to not enjoy Cabin in the Woods. Now again, sort of highlighting the strength of the recommendations as we're gonna approach the number one pick, my number 18 pick, almost all the way at the back, happens to be one of the best movies of 2020. Even if a lot of good movies did come out, I think Sound of Metal still would have stood out and been appreciated as one of the better films of the year. Now this is a featured directorial debut from a writer who did a lot of work on some really good movies, one being The Place Beyond the Pines, and then Sound of Metal has a similar sensibility, but in this movie, Riz Ahmed plays a drummer in a metal band who suddenly begins to lose his hearing. Now, it is a fairly quiet quiet movie, and I don't say that to be funny. There's a lot of times where you cannot hear, but then there's plenty of other times where you can hear tons of ambient noise. All sorts of little things you normally would not hear in a movie to sort of remind you what the main character is missing. It's subtle, but it works really well. But ultimately, this movie's beautifully written, beautifully directed, and really well acted by Riz Ahmed and some of the supporting cast. It sounds a little drier than it actually is. It actually does deliver some really interesting elements along the way. At the end of the day, you are just watching a movie about a man who's coming to grips with 
completely losing his hearing essentially overnight. While Knives Out is also on Prime and is certainly a fun, interesting movie, its writer-director Ryan Johnson's first movie I think is miles better despite having been done on a fraction, I mean a fraction of the budget of Knives Out. Brick is also sort of a detective story done in a different format than Knives Out. This is done in a high school with Joseph Gordon-Levitt, yet the dialogue has this very sort of film noir, gumshoe, sort of almost coded speak, almost kind of like this weird Shakespearean play, and it manages to work. If you were to just see a small clip of this movie out of context, like, let's say this one, for example. Yeah? Cold winters, but they got a great public transit system. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah? There's a thesaurus in the library. Yeah, it's under Y. Good, I'll wait. It's not going to make much sense because of the way that they're speaking, yet Ryan Johnson did a beautiful job with this script where it sort of slips you into this type of speaking pretty quickly and you're able to sort of go with it. This movie's got an incredible vibe to it and not only is it just a good detective story with a good mystery that unveils really well and has interesting characters, it's just this very different type of thing and I'm shocked that it works. It does not seem like something that will work. The concept on paper seems like ludicrous, like you're out of your mind for trying to make a movie where people talk in this unintelligible way yet it manages to work and it's incredibly entertaining. One of the better hidden gems on this list for sure. Featuring easily the worst script, some of the strangest performances, and the most inexperienced production value, my next pick is so entertaining that it outweighs everything that it lacks. I'm talking about the Boondock Saints. So this is a long time cult classic. Odds are there's not too many people watching that have not seen this movie. And odds are most of you at least enjoyed it if you didn't love it. But what a lot of you probably don't know is this was made by someone with no filmmaking experience whatsoever. Not only that, from what I understand, the script was written in a spiral bound notebook and the studio was so interested in making this project that they created one of the most outlandish and just weirdest deals with the writer director who again had zero experience. Not only did they give him enough money to make the movie, they bought him his favorite bar and signed him over the deed and essentially gave him the opportunity to make a movie with heavy hitting stars like Willem Dafoe and people loved it despite the fact that a lot of it is B-level at best. And I don't say that to take away from this movie, in fact that is one of its strengths, the fact that it is a B-level movie and it still manages to be so entertaining and fun. I think that is just an incredible quality that is in shockingly rare in filmmaking and that's what makes this one stand out so much and why it earns a spot on the list above some really well produced movies. Now I know I've talked a lot about some really well known movies so here's another one that I would consider to be a hidden gem despite the fact that it stars Joaquin Phoenix and Vince Vaughn, two major heavy hitters but this movie was done very very early on in their careers. It's called Clay Pigeons. Now this is a small movie, small story but incredibly well acted and it's got a very interesting plot that I basically can't go into details with without spoiling things because there's some major things that happen early on in this movie to hook you. Honestly, if you're not interested in this movie in the first 15 minutes, then it's probably not gonna be for you. But for most of you, it will hook you quickly Joaquin Phoenix obviously gives a great performance, he's a genius, but Vince Vaughn, surprisingly good here, and I don't say that because I don't really like Vince Vaughn, this is a standout performance for him. It's a little weird, but it really is something different than you normally see him do, and I love this movie for that. If this gem has somehow eluded you for years, it is going to be one of the better picks off of this list for you, just for the fact that you've never seen it or probably heard of it. Now this next sci-fi classic balances out all of its satirical comedy with enough sex, blood, and bullets to keep this sort of 80s gym relevant over 30 years later. I'm talking about Robocop. This is from director Paul Verhoeven who is famous for obviously Robocop but also Total Recall, Starship Troopers, and oddly enough, Showgirls. 
Robocop being one of his absolute best movies. So good they made multiple sequels, the second one actually being pretty decent. But like I said, Robocop does a fantastic job of sort of balancing out this really pretty heavy satirical comedy with a lot of violence and sexual content and a story that sort of wraps it all up and manages to deal with some pretty heavy themes. This is not just mindless action. Now, there is plenty of mindless action inside of this movie, but overall the experience is something really special again, why it's still so relevant today. If not more relevant today than ever before. In fact, I cannot believe they f***ed up so bad to make a PG-13 version of this movie. The rated R quality of Robocop is what makes it so good. In particular, it's one of the best sort of rated R action movies of all time. I take that back. It's one of the best at being particularly explicitly rated R. I don't know if that's an actual sentence, but let's move on. Now, one of the most successful indie directors of all time has created some cutting edge, award-winning movies like Boyhood and A Scanner Darkly, but still to this day, one of his first movies is easily his best and most loved and appreciated, and that is Richard Linklater's Dazed and Confused. Now, this is just the type of movie that you could put on at almost any time, any day and you're going to enjoy it. Not only is it funny, but the richness of the characters is what makes this work because if you remember, Dazed and Confused does not have much of a story. There is kind of a story about these kids that are getting out of school and then starting their summer and having some parties and they're going out and drinking, but it's essentially slice of life, day in the life of these teenagers and the world that Linklater creates in this movie and really all of his movies is so rich that you want to spend time there over and over again. You feel like you get to know the characters. While I'm not a big fan of Ben Affleck, I do love him in this movie. I think his asshole roles are easily his best. I mean, he's just really good at it for some reason and Dazed and Confused is maybe the best example of that. But you've got all sorts of early performances from some people who went on to have some really fantastic careers. Odds are no matter who you are, where you come from, there are one, two, maybe three characters in this movie that that you will be able to identify with on a really deep level, more so than a lot of other movies, even some of the great movies on this list. That's why this movie has endured for so long. You got an anonymous text with an address. I've heard of these places. They said you were brutal. I can be. I want you to hurt them. Now, while Clay Pigeons was a great movie featuring a killer and Joaquin Phoenix, my next pick features Joaquin Phoenix as a killer. No, it's not Joker, but Joker fans should still get a kick out of seeing him kill people in You Were Never Really Here. Now, this is an indie flick that is shot beautifully. It's dark, yet every shot, almost every frame of this movie is stunning. Joaquin Phoenix's character is really fantastic in this one. He's put on a ton of weight. If you compare his weight to Joker, he's really heavy in this one. He's very quiet, very subdued, very different type of character than you've seen him play in some other things, but he manages to bring a lot of life to this character. And, but in this movie, he plays a man who makes it his business to recover children from trafficking. So it's very heavy subject matter and can be very, very brutal at times, yet it's also stunningly beautiful at other times. There's an incredible soundtrack by Johnny Greenwood from Radiohead, and it's just an amazing movie overall. It does feel somewhat like a short story because you're really focused on this main character and a sort of a smaller scale story, yet that's not really a complaint. That's one of its strengths. That's why it feels so rich and so deep because you're not dealing with a lot of complexities to the story. If you love darker thriller type stuff, this is an absolute gem that happens to be an Amazon original as well. So it's not going anywhere, but don't wait. Watch it soon if it sounds like your kind of thing, because I'm telling you it is. And then we'll round up my bottom 10 and move on to my top 10 with another really dark movie, but it's technically the only foreign language movie on this list, Amoros Peros. 
translates to love is a bitch. Now, this movie starts off with a very brutal sequence. If you've ever visited the website, does the dog die? Don't watch this movie. I, I don't quite understand why you can't watch a movie where a dog dies for pretend, but this is multiple stories that all tie together, and I'm really not a fan of that format. I feel like it's often very clunky and sort of forced. Not in this movie. It is glued together better, than almost any other movie done in that format I've ever seen. And this is from a director who is known for doing things differently. He went on to do Birdman and The Revenant. So he's famous for sort of odd production styles. And Amoros Peros is a fantastic example of that. In addition to just being this beautifully dark movie that is about love, but it's about some of the darker sides of love. And again, it just works really, really well. So before moving on to my top 10, if you're finding that not all of these movies are available on Prime Video for you, it means you're either watching this in the future, the video has been up for so long, or you're in a different country and not everything is available to you. But you're able to access all of these movies regardless of what time it is or what country you're in using the proper VPN service. Today's sponsor, CyberGhost VPN, is that type of VPN service. In addition to making your web browsing safe, secure, and private, CyberGhost VPN also has specialized servers that allow you to access Prime Video, Netflix, and other streaming services in a multitude of countries. And not just foreign movies where you're gonna have to read foreign languages, big blockbuster American movies that are not available in Netflix in the US. They're available overseas, you can unlock those. Likewise, if you're not in the US and you wanna access everything that I talk about here on the channel, CyberGhost is a fantastic way to do that. It's super easy to use, and they have an unheard of 45 day money back guarantee. So you can try this thing out for a while and get a full refund if you're not happy with it. They have fantastic 24 seven customer support to help you get it set up on multiple devices. Speaking of devices, you can use it on up to seven at the exact same time. And it's all the different types of devices that you use. Not only does that sound like an incredible deal, right now they are offering it for as low as $2.19 a month. That's $2.19 a month for my viewers when you use a link in the description. That is less than half, less than half the cost of a movie rental to unlock vast new libraries. It's hard to get a better deal than that in my opinion. So check out the link in the description below. See if it's a good fit for you. At least try it out for the 45 days. But let's go ahead and move on with the rest of this list. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Oh, and in case I don't see you, Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Because so-called crowd-pleaser movies have elements that appeal to such a broad audience, they're often enjoyable but immediately forgettable. But one of the greatest and most successful crowd-pleaser movies of all time is The Truman Show. This movie's so enduring, I think because it's got such an odd and interesting premise, yet it still manages to be incredibly relatable. That's a very rare thing for movies to pull off, and I really do think that that is what makes this work before you even get to it being one of Jim Carrey's best performances. There's a weird little scene where he's gardening with his ass out where I feel like he just could not resist being a goofball. Outside of that one moment, he does a great job with this one, even when he is acting weird, it's because he's in such a weird sort of manic state because he really believes that people are watching him. Because they really are, and I think that's what makes this movie relatable. I think we all sort of get the feeling from time to time that we're being watched or something, and The Truman Show managed to distill that in such a beautiful way. And not only do I love all the little elements of this movie as he's sort of discovering what's really going on, I think it's got one of the greatest, most uplifting endings in movie history. Seen on the staircase, I just think it's one of my favorite movie endings of all time. It's a personal favorite of mine. I realize I don't normally spoil movies on this show, but if you've never seen The Truman Show, I, the statute of limitations is up on spoilers for that movie. But I'll continue with this list and stay far clear of spoilers as we proceed. Now, I love almost almost all of Guy Ritchie's movies. Yep, I bet you didn't know that he wrote and directed Aladdin, but my absolute favorite of his and has been since the start 
is his first movie, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Now, the reason I said that Ameros Peros was technically the only foreign language film is because a lot of you may need to watch this movie with subtitles on. Not only is there thick British accents in this one, they're speaking in slang, and it's very difficult to understand what they're saying a lot of the time. I understand it because I love these types of movies. I can just hear it, but I've watched this movie and others like it with friends and family, and they're baffled and confused as to how I can understand what people are saying. That said, it's a beautiful, entertaining language, and you can generally follow the story of these friends who get in the debt very early on with the wrong guy, and then have to spend the rest of the movie figuring out how to get enough money. There's a great cast of characters in this one. This one's just got an incredible flavor to it. Even the graininess of the film quality just adds to the flavor of this one. Yeah, there's a little bit of nostalgia wrapped up in this with me, but I have watched it again in recent months and it's just incredibly entertaining from start to finish. Just a real fun movie. I think this one paired with Snatch and his most recent movie, The Gentleman, make for a really great British gangster trilogy. From 1951, by far the oldest movie on this list stars Humphrey Bogart, Katherine Hepburn, and is directed by the legendary 10-time Academy Award nominee, John Huston. That is the African Queen. Now, I love old movies as much as the next person, but there's not a lot of really good ones that hold up that can be found on streaming services. With the exception of HBO Max having Turner Classic Movies, they've got a great selection now. Most streaming services have not had a lot to offer in terms of classic movies, but The African Queen is exceptional because it still manages to work so well. There's some incredible shots in this one, some great action, and the story is still really relatable. It's got a beautiful look to it, and it's just a this great story about these two people in this clunker of a boat going down this river and they don't like each other yet they're sort of falling in love at the same time. It's got a tempo and a pace that modern audiences I think can still engage with and enjoy. If maybe you're one of my younger viewers, you've never seen it, you're itching for something new to watch, try watching something old and it'll be like watching something with a new set of eyes. It'll give you a better frame of reference for other movies as well. That's really where I think a lot of the value in watching older movies comes from because you can see how things transformed over time and you will appreciate things made today, either more or less depending on how good they are, if you have experience watching good movies that were made 50, 60, 70 years ago. Well, everyone knows Custer died at Little Bighorn. What this book presupposes is, maybe he didn't? Now, Wes Anderson is one of my favorite directors, and I love all of his movies, so much so it would be hard for me to pick my absolute favorite, but gun to my head, gotta choose, I'm gonna say The Royal Tenenbaums. To me, if you've not gotten into Wes Anderson, this is maybe the movie to watch. This is the best place to start. He's got so much variety. Even though his style is pretty consistent, the types of movies that he makes is pretty varied. Yet, The Royal Tenenbaums is really just pure Wes Anderson. And it's not perfect. It is a little messy. It's a little loose. In fact, I find that to be the case with a lot of his movies but the strength relies on all these different characters and his filmmaking style. This is a movie that's funny at times, that's quirky at times, that's artsy at times, that's really heavy and dramatic at times. It can kind of take you by surprise at moments, but the characters, again, beautifully rich, incredible production design, and while there's not a core necessarily plot or story, some of the greatest movies of all time don't really feature a, a strong plot. The Royal Tenenbaums being a great example of that. If it's been a while since you've watched it, it's well worth revisiting for the killer soundtrack and the production design and just, it, it, they're great characters to revisit and spend more time with. And if you've never seen it, or you haven't really gotten into Wes Anderson, I highly recommend making this one of the first ones you watch off of this list. Now, I love the Coen brothers as much as anybody. They're some of my favorite directors, hands down. I also love Jeff Bridges and everyone involved with their True Grit remake, but it just did not have the magic of the original starring John Wayne. I grew up on this movie. I love this movie. I love the characters. I love multiple sequences, and I mean love multiple sequences from this movie. You can tell in my voice there's a little bit of nostalgia for this one, but it's still incredibly entertaining. The river crossing scene is fantastic. The dialogue written for this movie, especially for the time, 
is really pretty standout stuff. And then there's the stakeout at the cabin where they smoke the guys out. And you get in there and a young Dennis Hopper is in there. Robert Duvall has a great role as one of the bad guys. Just a good, rich world that's not like your typical Western. It's not necessarily we've got to have a showdown with the bad guys at noon or bandits rolling into a small town. No, it's about a young girl who wants to hire a man to go kill the person that killed her father. It's pretty simple. It's a revenge story that somehow manages to be fairly family friendly. I tread lightly there because there is a fair amount of violence in there, but it's still just a beautiful movie to watch with some really funny lines and sequences in it as well. It is hard to deny the brilliant instincts of James Cameron. I mean, the guy can't miss, but one of his most fun and underappreciated movies, in my opinion, has got to be True Lies. Now, this obviously was a hit big blockbuster movie. I'm not making it out to sound like this is some sort of hidden gem that nobody knows about, but I feel like time has kind of forgotten this one, and I'm surprised to see it available on Prime Video. This is a movie I have loved for decades now. It is one of the most fun action movies of all time. You get so many incredible sequences with this. You get Schwarzenegger on horseback chasing a guy on a motorcycle through a hotel, up an elevator, up to the roof. You get sort of the secret agent thing with this underground spy network run by Charlton Heston. I'm not a big Tom Arnold fan, but he's in this movie and he's funny just enough to not really disrupt things. He adds just the right amount of comedic relief. And then speaking of comedic relief, you get Bill Paxton doing his great creeper role. And then you get, of course, the famous Jamie Lee Curtis strip scene, which is still super hot stuff today. It does not feel super dated at all. She really killed it with that. Everybody brought their A game for this movie. And it is just, again, I cannot stress how fun this movie is. I absolutely love it. If it's been a while since you've seen it, I can guarantee you, you have forgotten how fun True Lies is. Now, even though I don't have the best relationship with Mel Gibson, Mel, my man, what's up? You f***ed my damn. Sorry, we're late. Uh, what do you what do you think? What do you think of these? Uh, what do you think of these big old shades? No, oh, they look ridiculous. Get rid of them, why don't you? They look stupid. I'm just telling you. Well, I don't you dare hang up on me. You hang up. I'm coming over there. Well, Mel, if you're gonna threaten me, I just call the police. What? F*** you. I don't involve. I don't involve the police in anything because I stand up for myself. You, you weak. You call the f cops. Despite all of that, I still absolutely love what he did with Apocalypto. I don't care that this movie's not historically accurate. I don't care that it mixes different cultures and things. It's just an incredible adventure story that, again, it's foreign language technically, yet this was a Hollywood production, so it's not really a foreign film. So you do have to read subtitles for this one. But most of the dialogue occurs in the first 15 minutes of the movie, where you're introduced to this tribe, particularly the main character. And as soon as people are abducted, this just takes off into this incredible adventure that takes you through this really rich, beautiful world that's also very grim and dark. And then this entire sort of action chase sequence kicks off. And this has got more in common with something like Fury Road where it's got this action sequence that doesn't seem to end. It just keeps going. That's what makes Apocalypto so special. And visually, it gives you something that I don't think you can see in any other movie, at least not in the way that it's presented in Apocalypto. Shoot me. Come on. No, I can't shoot. Do it! <laughs> How'd you like that? How'd you do it? Magic. While it's not my favorite Christopher Nolan movie, it's up there, and it might also be the most flawless movie he's ever made. That's The Prestige. Now, Christopher Nolan movies, as good and as fun as they are, they always get some criticism for things not quite making sense or you not being able to understand what people are saying. Yet The Prestige, as complicated and as weird as this one gets, it's really just a story about two magicians that are battling it out over the course of several decades. This is also one of his more beautiful movies. His movies often have sort of a dark undertone to him. And while this one does, you're in the time period of Nikola Tesla, who is, I think, brilliantly played by David Bowie. I should take that back. Brilliantly cast with David Bowie and brilliantly performed by David Bowie. I think that whole element is really cool and interesting. And again, the world and the time period that you're in is a really fun one to spend some time in as well. If you've never seen this one, or maybe you forgot, 
kind of how twisted this one ultimately gets. It's been a while since I've said this on the channel, but me talking about it now, I feel like I need to rewatch it soon. So Stanley Kubrick has had sort of an unplanned run in my latest videos with A Clockwork Orange getting mentioned and Eyes Wide Shut. And his next movie, while it's the only comedy he ever did, it's also maybe his most realistic movie, even if it doesn't seem like it is on the surface, and that is Dr. Strange Love or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. I'm not gonna put that entire title up on the screen because you won't be able to see any of the footage of the movie, but this is a satirical comedy that in black and white about a nuclear incident. And if you don't know, during the nuclear arms race, there were a lot of bombs in planes being flown around the planet. So there was this sort of incredible threat that was going on that most people didn't even know about. In fact, I believe it might've been North Carolina where one such bomb was dropped, and I don't mean dropped to cause an explosion, like, they accidentally dropped it. It just landed with a thud, it didn't detonate. But that highlights how realistic something like this could be. It breaks down sort of the chain of command with the nuclear codes and how something could go completely awry. So just a gem of a classic movie. If you've never seen it, you like some of Stanley Kubrick's other stuff maybe, this is one that you have to see. Like I've said in recent videos, if you consider yourself a film buff, of any kind, or you would like to be, this is one that I would consider to be required viewing. And I could say the same thing about my number one pick, easily the longest movie on this list, coming in at just two minutes under three hours. It's one of the greatest Westerns of all time, and all 178 minutes are jam-packed with some of the most beautiful scenes ever put to film in the good, the bad, and the ugly. And while Sergio Leone is easily the most brilliant Western director that has ever lived and possibly will ever live, this is not even my favorite movie of his. I'm partial to Once Upon a Time in the West, yet the good and the bad and the ugly is undeniably his best film. In fact, I recommend watching the entire Man With No Name or Dollars trilogy, which is technically not a trilogy because everyone's different characters, but I love that style of filmmaking. He essentially took these three Clint Eastwood movies and retold a similar story three different times, getting better along the way, finishing off this trilogy with the good, the bad, and the ugly, easily the most complex one because you're dealing with these three really detailed, essentially protagonists. This movie's got three main characters. It is a linear story that works together, yet you've got these three protagonists that you're sort of rooting for and against over and over again as it goes through. Finishing up with one of the greatest ending sequences in movie history, I'm just gonna say it required viewing. If you consider yourself to be any sort of movie lover, you have to see this movie. It is not a dull three hours to spend. Trust me on that one, but let me know which of these movies you're most looking forward to watch in the comments below. While you're down there, let's also thank the Patreon supporters. If you're interested in becoming a Patreon supporter, there is a link in the description below. There's also a link where you can become a channel member and get access to a bunch of exclusive videos I've already created with new ones coming out every single week. But I will keep making these videos for you as long as you keep watching them. Thanks for watching this Prime Video episode and you will see me on the next one.